2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter. I want to uh, thank the Lord for someone I was talking to yesterday. And I had no idea that they watched the sermons that we post online. And they let me know that what a blessing it was to them and they're thinking about coming to church. And so that's not the first time. There have been people that have come up to Reese at the store and told her that they watched the sermons on line and so I'm thankful for that today that uh, there are those out there and sometimes the enemy might try and discourage you as you work for the Lord but I truly believe with all my heart that we'll never really know the impact of our witness our testimony our life that we live for the Lord until we get to the other side and we really see the people that the Lord influenced through us amen and that's not just through this ministry I'm talking about even through your daily life and the people that you come in contact with and that have come to know Jesus, the Jesus that you represent to them, the, the uh, love that you show them and the, and the difference that they see in you. So I'm thankful today that we continue to hear from people all the time that are watching the videos and are being blessed and that are listening on the radio <coughs> stations excuse me, and are being blessed. So thankful for what the Lord is doing. I believe He's doing a quick work in these last days. I believe that that He is using ministries, smaller ministries, because most, and not all, but most of the bigger ministries have lost sight of really what the goal is. So he's, He is using storefront churches, and he's used, there are some big ministries that, that certainly are still doing the work of the Lord. But the body of Christ, He is using the body of Christ, the smaller members are what we would say are the smaller members, to reach people on a global basis. Amen. We've never lived in a time where it was where the door was open any wider for you to be able to, regardless of the size of your ministry, regardless of the size of your church, to be able to reach all the way around the globe. Amen. So we appreciate what God is doing with that. I want to talk to you this morning for a few minutes about the battle you've been fighting this week. About the battle that, that we've all been fighting for a long time. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I want to talk to you about Jehoshaphat in the book of 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter. God has one prescription for victory. And sometimes it takes us a long way, we have to go a long way around to figure that one out. But we're going to look at that today. God's prescribed order of victory for you. You can't have victory any other way. God's prescribed order of victory for me. And you can't. I can't have victory any other way. There have been books written to tell you how to have victory. And they say, use this 40-day fast. Do this 40 days of cleansing. Do this ritual of positive thinking every morning. Get up and begin your positive thinking ritual. None of that is God's prescribed order of victory. There's, always, there's only one way, and that way it's been the same since the beginning. There were types of it during the Old Testament until that which was perfect would come. But still, the prescribed order of victory has always been the same. And let's look at... Jehoshaphat in his battle this morning in 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter, the first verse. I'm not going to try to keep you very long. I've been under the weather myself the last couple of days. <clears throat> but that's alright. The Lord knows all of that. And we ask that He bless His Word this morning and open our hearts and our ears for the Word of God, the seed to be planted inside of us, that it will take roots downward and bear fruit up or upwards. And we pray for each and every one that watch this and each and every one that hear this by way of internet, by way of radio, CDs, cassettes, however you get the material, we pray today that this Word will be a blessing to you and that the seed of the Word of God will be planted inside of your heart and in your mind. And in Jesus' name we pray that. Second Chronicles, the 20th chapter. We find Jehoshaphat here staring down the barrel of a big enemy. We find him, as we do oftentimes, God's people are outnumbered. Amen. Yeah. All the way through the... You, you feel like today that you're just outnumbered. Well, listen. <laughs> you're amongst a good crowd because yeah. all God's people have always been the least. Amen. God's people have always been the ones that were outnumbered. They were outmanned. They were outmilitary. Amen. That's probably not a word, but I'll throw that redneckism in there. They, they, they faced down armies that were greater and mightier than they were. Brother Sleeth, when the children of Israel were... Held in bondage in Egypt, they were held by the mighty hand of Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. They were nothing compared to Pharaoh and his army and his kingdom at that time in the eyes of man. Yeah. Oh, but thank God today, as we learned 
the last week or so, little as much when God is in it. Amen? And God's people, no matter the number, if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen? That's His Word. You may have the greatest military. You may have the greatest warriors. You may have the greatest weapons. But all of that fades in comparison to God's people who have God on their side. Amen? Same way for you today. The enemy may look bigger than you. He may, he may convince you he's stronger than you. He may have you what seems like you may felt like this week you've been down for the count. Amen? But if God is with you, who can be against you? And this is what Jehoshaphat is facing. I want to read a little bit of this. Beginning of the first verse. And it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them other besides the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Now listen to this. This wasn't just one group of people, but these enemies of Jehoshaphat get together and join forces. We see the children of Moab, the children of Ammon. And with them other besides there were some of the Ammonites they came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side of Syria. And behold, they be in Hazanatamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared, and he set himself to seek the Lord. Why? Because the army that was coming against them was greater than Jehoshaphat's army. So Jehoshaphat, when he gets the word, and that's the reason for these people that come and brought him the, the, the news, the reason they said that there cometh a great multitude is they wanted to let Jehoshaphat know that the number that's on its way to do battle is greater than your number. The army that is on its way to do battle with you is greater than you. Thank God Jehoshaphat realized, hey, they might be greater than us in number. They might be greater than us as far as an army and their skills go. But I'm going to turn to God. Amen? The Bible says Jehoshaphat sets his face to seek God. He feared and he set himself to seek the Lord. That's what the Word of God says. And he proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. He began to seek God for his answer. He didn't start devising, let's see, how can I use my men to do this? How can I use the power that I have at hand to defeat this army? If he had them, he would have went down in defeat. And that's when we go down in defeat. Whenever we try to figure out how am I going to defeat the devil? How am I going to have the victory? How am I going to be able to do this thing in my own flesh, in my own works, and in my own way? We get in trouble that way and we will face nothing but defeat until we realize the victory is not in our power. The victory is not in our strength. The victory is not in what we can do. Jehoshaphat realizes this and he turns to God and he begins to seek God for the answer. Drop down to verse 14. You will find in the following verses of the verse 3 there that Jehoshaphat begins to seek God and he begins to, to seek the face of God and all of the people there. The Bible says in verse 14 that upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. Now, Jehoshaphat has set his face toward God to find out what God's prescribed order of victory would be for them. Jehoshaphat knows what God has done before. <laughs> he knows how mighty and strong the hand of God is. So he turns to Him and he seeks Him for His knowledge and for, his, for, for, for victory over this enemy. And the Spirit of the Lord comes upon this man. And this is what he speaks to him. And he said in verse 15, Hearken ye all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed, by reason of this great multitude. Now let's stop there for a minute. Those that came with the news to Jehoshaphat that the army was coming, they said There's a, they're great. It's a great multitude. Now the Spirit of the Lord confirms 
what was said to the messengers that came to Jehoshaphat in the beginning. This is a great multitude. But do not be dismayed. Do not be afraid. And you might be thinking there, if you were standing in the congregation, you might be thinking, wow, don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. But this army's great. So what, what answer is, going to God, is God going to give them to assure them, to reassure them that they don't have to fear the enemy? Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. For the battle, oh, I wish we could get this this morning. We could get this. I just closed the book and going on. For the battle is not yours, but God's. You have fought all week to try and defeat a defeated foe. Oh, you didn't hear what I said, did you, brothers? Please hear me. You have fought all week to try and defeat a defeated enemy. When if we can learn to walk in the victory that has already been given to us by the finished wall, oh, hallelujah, by the finished work that He has done, we would really, would there still be a fight? Sure, but I got news for you. There is a difference. There is a difference whenever you're in a struggle and you're in a fight and you're thinking, oh, I don't know if I'm going to make it or not. I think the old devil's about beat me to death. I don't know if I can make it. I'm just going to barely drag in. There's a difference in that than when you're in the heat of the battle knowing that you know, that you know, that you know that the victory has already been won. Hallelujah. That the battle is not yours. That it's God's. And if you'll trust Him, He will see you through. And you've already been proclaimed the victor. Yeah. You've already been proclaimed the victor. There's a, that's how you can walk through the battle with victory. That's how you can walk through the trial with victory. That's how you can walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. Because Jesus is with you and the battle has been won and the victory has been proclaimed and your hand has been held up as the victor because of what He did. That's what he's telling Jehoshaphat. The battle is not yours. Listen to me. Out there by in video land, you've been fighting the same old devil trying to defeat him for years because he convinced you he's not defeated. Yeah. Oh, but he is defeated today. Amen. Hallelujah. He has been defeated by Jesus Christ. And if we, which are grafted into the vine, would realize that, sure there's battles. Sure, there, there, there are uh, times of, of, str of struggle and trial. But if we knew already, it doesn't matter because when the dust clears, I am, I've already been declared a winner. Amen? It doesn't matter how tough the fight gets. It doesn't matter what I'm going through. It doesn't matter what hell's throwing at me. I'm on the winning side. Hallelujah. The battle is not mine. It belongs to God. So Jehoshaphat gets his answer from the Lord. The battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go ye down against them. Behold, they come up the cliff of Ziz, and ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeriel. Jer ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed, Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Did you hear that? For the Lord will be with you. The fear that gripped Jehoshaphat as he heard the messenger saying, "The great army is coming." You can hear them. You can hear the hoof beat, hoof beats of the multitude of horses as they cross the horizon. The fear that gripped Jehoshaphat was about to take flight because God said, "Jehoshaphat, the battle don't belong to you. It belongs to me." God's telling us that today too. Amen. The battle is not yours. The battle is mine. Fear not. Neither be dismayed. Stand in the victory. Stand still and see the salvation of God today. Stand still and see the salvation of God. For the Lord will be with you. And Jehoshaphat, in verse 18, bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Here's the answer, Jehoshaphat. You're right. You're not able to do this on your own. You're right. You're, you don't have enough military to win this fight. Come on now. You don't have enough weaponry to win this on your own. Your flesh ain't strong enough to win this. 
Your carnal army is not mighty enough uh, to claim the victory. But, uh, but be not dismayed. Don't be afraid. Because I'm with you. And the battle's not yours. The battle is mine. And I've already won the war. Amen. Oh, if we could just get that down inside of us today. He's already won the war. What happens to Jehoshaphat? Listen to this. Drop down to verse 20. 2 Chronicles 20 and 20. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God. So shall you be established. Believe His prophets. So shall you prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and to say, Praise the Lord for His mercy endureth forever. Did Jehoshaphat do this to win the battle? No. If you stood back from afar and you saw the great multitude of army that was coming and you saw Jehoshaphat that was small in comparison to what they faced, and you saw Jehoshaphat send out, not the armor bearers, <laughs> not the mightiest men of valor to go to the front line and try to war, fight them off, but he sent out the praisers and the singers yeah. and the worshipers. You might stand back and you might sit back and think, what in the world is he doing? Maybe he thinks them singers can get him the victory. Maybe he thinks those praisers can get him the victory. What they didn't understand what the enemy doesn't understand about you is that they were singing and they were praising not so they could get the victory, but because the victory was already theirs. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The victory was already theirs. The battle was already won. So they were praising Him and lifting up the name of God. So when the enemy sees you and he's beat on you, and he will, like an old woodpecker, he'll peck on you all week. Amen. He's done everything he could. But you're still praising God. You're still, just like Job, though God slay me, yet will I trust in Him. Hallelujah. Oh, my, my though he, He's going to try me with fire, but I'll come forth as gold. Amen. When He sees you still at church, and not just at church, He expects maybe you'll do some of that when you get there. If He can't keep you from getting there, He's expecting you'll do a little bit when you get there. But at home, He sees you with your hands held, or maybe with just a praise coming from inside. Lord, I thank You. I praise You. I lift You up in the beauty of holiness. And He thinks you think that's going to get you the victory no, stupid. We already have the victory. That's why we're praising and shouting. Amen. Hallelujah. The victory is already belongs to us today. We don't have to praise for it. We don't have because he's already fought for it and won the battle. What happens to, to Jehoshaphat? He sends out the praisers. And you might have scratched your head and wondered what in the world you're doing. What you what what you not would have not known is that the battle was already won. Already won. And when they begin to sing and to praise, the Bible says in verse 22 that the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of the mount, of Mount Seir, utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy another. Huh? They turned against one another with their own swords. And when Judah came toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitude, and behold, they were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none escaped. Because the battle was not Jehoshaphat's. It was not his armies. The battle today is not yours. It is not for your flesh to win. Your flesh cannot win it. That's why you feel so helpless. That's why you feel defeated. That's why you feel like you just ain't no good for nothing because you think because you've been beaten and trying to knock down a giant that's already dead. Amen. Already. The victory is already yours. The victory is already yours. So it says they looked 
And they were all fallen dead. And none escaped. Not one. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Not one escaped that day on Calvary either. Oh, say, so Brother Billy, where are you going with this? I'll show you here in a minute. Not one escaped. Not one enemy that you'll face escaped defeat that day on Calvary. When the hammer drove the nails, the victory bugle was being sounded. As he hung between heaven and earth, and he used his last breath to say, It is finished. Every devil and demon in hell, every, every sin, every trespass, every transgression, every iniquity would be defeated at the cross of Calvary by the blood of the Lamb that was spilled on the final and authoritative altar of God. All of the lambs and the rams and the bullocks that had been, this blood had been shed in the Old Testament led up to the fact that He that is more perfect is coming. That He that can take away not just cover, but take away the sin of the world is coming. And when He comes, when He hangs between heaven and earth, and whenever He says it is finished, the temple veil, that which separated God from man, would be torn in half from top to bottom. And victory would be proclaimed for all of those that will accept what He did on the cross of Calvary. Jehoshaphat, the battle's not yours. Rodney, the battle is not yours. You out there today that watch, you out there today that listen, the battle is not yours. The battle is God's. And He's already... I know that you, I have heard it my whole life. People say it. I don't know if I'm going to make it or not. The struggle's just too hard. The battle's just too hard. Yeah, but if we could ever get a hold of the fact, the truth, that the battle is not ours. It belongs to God. He's already fought the battle. He's already won the war. And no matter what comes, it doesn't matter what goes, we still have the victory. Amen. Troubles and trials on every hand do not affect the, whether you have the victory or not. The way we feel today doesn't affect whether we have the victory or not. What man says doesn't affect the, whether we have the victory or not. What the devil says doesn't affect whether we have the victory or not. The only way he can defeat you is if, he, is, is if he convinces you that he's not defeated. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's the only way he can get you down and defeated is if he convinces you that he's not defeated. Oh, but he is, and I can show it to you clearly in Scripture today. So whenever they get there, they find all the dead bodies. None have escaped. And the Bible says in verse 25, when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them an abundance both of riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels. And it said when they stripped off for the, that they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry. And they were three days in gathering the spoil. It was so much. You see, today the victory that God has wrought for us is so much of an abundance that we can't wrap our feeble mind around it. Sin was defeated at Calvary. Hell was defeated at Calvary. Death was defeated at Calvary. Every enemy that you ever face was defeated at Calvary. Because of this simple fact, if you put your faith in what He did, if you will trust what He did, that victory, that inheritance belongs to you. We find over in Joshua, the 10th chapter, I'm not going to go there, I was going to, but I'm not going to go there. Joshua faced some of the same kind of thing that Jehoshaphat was facing. The Lord would speak to Joshua as he went out to battle. In Joshua 10 and 8, he would say, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. It's already done, Joshua. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. And the Bible says there, if you drop down to verse 10, that the Lord discomfited Joshua's enemy before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them along the way that goeth up to Bethron and smote them to, Az to Azekah. So God brings this great victory to Joshua and He tells him, He says, it's already done. 
And that's what he's trying to tell us today. It's already done. I've already done it. The battle that Joshua faced, the battle that Jehoshaphat faced was enough to grip someone's heart with fear. Unless you realized that God was on your side. Unless you realized that God has already given you the victory. Why did all them people die in the wilderness? We could say rebellion. We could say because they were just they they were they were full of sin and they were wicked and evil. The reason they did not cross over into Canaan's land is because they did not trust the promise of God. God had already promised them He would take them over. But because the battle looked too hard, because the fight looked too tough, because the enemy looked too big, they forgot all about the fact that God said, I've already won this for you. I, all you got to do is trust me. All you got to do is put your faith in my promise. And we can talk about them old boys all we want, but the same thing happens to us today. We get downcast, defeated, bruised, and discouraged because we forget that God has already, no matter the size of the giant, God has already promised us the victory. God has already won the victory for us. Sin is already, that sin that does so easily beset you and that weight that seems to drag you down, that sin has already been defeated at Calvary when Jesus gave His life on the cross. So you will, in your flesh at times, if you look across there and you see the enemy, you might think today, what's this got to do with me? It's got a lot to do with you. Because we face an enemy today. The Bible says you have an adversary. The Bible tells us who that adversary is. It's the devil. Amen? And just as these two examples that I've talked a little bit about here today, if you look with the carnal eye, if you look at you, and you look at the devil, you would say, good riddance, buddy. You don't have the strength to overcome that. You don't have the power to overcome that. And you don't within yourself. That's right. But when you realize that defeat has already been stamped on the head of your enemy and that you have already been raised up as the victor if you put your faith in Jesus Christ and His finished work, you can walk in victory and there is not a devil, there is not a demon, there is not a weight that can stop you from making it because you realize as many times as I fall, as many times as I fail, my faith ain't in me. My faith ain't in me. My trust ain't in me. My faith and my trust is in His finished work at the cross of Calvary. That is His prescribed order of victory today. Not in our 40 days of positive thinking and fasting and prayer and, and the, the purpose-driven church and the purpose-driven life and all of that stuff. Our faith today is in nothing less than Jesus Christ, His finished work on the cross and His righteousness today. And when we realize that He's already won the victory, that He's already won the war, and that that is a gift to us if we will accept what He did at the cross and put our faith in that, then we can walk in victory today. No matter the giant that comes up, no matter the trial that we walk through, no matter how dark the valley gets, we can say, well, I know I don't see it right now, but victory has already been given to me. They, the old church used to say, victory is mine, victory is mine, victory today is mine. And then they'd get up and testify about how bad the devil beat them down all week and chased them all over the place and kicked them and bruised them and cut them and, and, and almost killed them. Amen. If they just realize the victory is in the cross. The victory is in it's the slain Lamb of God on the cross of Calvary that defeated the enemy that day on Calvary. Listen to this and I'm closing. Ephesians 6 and 10 tells us it's actually Ephesians 6 and 12 that we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Then he goes on to tell us about putting on the armor of God, and all of that's powerful, but I don't, I don't want to go into that. What I want you to realize what we wrestle against today. Principalities, powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now here you are. You're the one facing the principalities, the rulers of darkness, the wickedness. And if you look at that, if you get your eyes off of our source of victory today, 
You'll walk around thinking, there ain't no way I can make it. But if you can get what I'm telling you today, this scripture I'm about to give you, if you can get it down in your gut, if you can get it planted in you, even though you are facing principalities, you are facing powers, you are facing rulers of darkness of this world, even though your flesh may be saying, oh no, what are we going to do? If you look at your enemy and the battle through your carnal eyes and you compare your ability to the enemy that you face, then you're thinking, there ain't no way. I can't make it. You'll begin to be gripped with fear. But God has a promise for us. Turn with me to Colossians 2 and 13. Colossians, the second chapter, the 13th verse. God's promise for us today is the same as the promise that He gave to Jehoshaphat. The same as the promise that He gave to David. We find our promise that He's given us and the recipe, the, the prescribed order of victory, we find it in Colossians, the second chapter. Beginning in the 13th verse. It says, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath He quickened together with Him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now that's you. If you've been born again, what follows this belongs to you. You have become an heir. You have been grafted into the vine. If you're out there today and you don't know Jesus, you've never accepted Him as your Lord and Savior, you're not born again. The promises in this book do not belong to you until you become born again. You must first be, you can't go to the reading of a will and expect to get something unless you're an heir to the will. Amen? This is the will of God. This here He has heir to those that will accept His finished work that will accept His finished work. Amen? I can't go find me a room today where, some, where a multi-million dollar man has, has, has left, a, or a woman that, that was a multi-millionaire has left a fortune and go in there and sit down and say, well, where's my piece? Where's my part? He didn't know me. I didn't know him. Amen? That's what people do. They'll say, well, but the Bible says yes, but the Bible's promises do not belong to you unless you've been grafted into the vine, unless you've been born again, unless you've been washed in the blood. But if you have... This belongs to you today. Listen to this. Number 14. Verse 14. Uh, Colossians 2 and 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. He's talking about the finished work of the cross. And took it out of the way. Talking about what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. Nailing it to His cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers. Now, wait a minute. What did we just read that we fight against? We read that we fight against principalities. It says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Did I read that right? Principalities and the powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. Now we find here in Colossians 2 and 15 that in His cross, His finished work at the cross, He spoiled what? Your enemies. Principalities and powers. He made a show of them. Who? Principalities and powers. Those things that you wrestle against. He defeated. He spoiled them. He made a show of them openly. He tried to, Oh, listen. This next part says, triumphing over them in it. In what? In His cross. The very things that we read, that we wrestle against. Principalities and powers. Rulers of darkness of this world. The Bible says here that Jesus spoiled those things. He defeated those things. He made a show of them openly. He triumphed over them in His cross, His finished work. So now when you look at it this way, if you go over there and you look and you see, well, I'm facing principalities. I'm facing powers of darkness. I'm facing rulers of wickedness in this world. How am I ever going to win this battle? The deck's stacked against me. But then if you go over and read the rest of the story, hallelujah, Colossians, the second chapter, you find out that those enemies that you've been wrestling with, Jesus already defeated them at the cross of Calvary. He already triumphed over principalities. He already triumphed over Satan. He already triumphed over death. He already triumphed over the enemies and the principalities that you face. They are already defeated. They're already defeated. I like what one scholar said. I'm going to read you his word for word. Triumph over them in it. In the cross. Whereby he got the victory. When he triumphed. In his cross. Where his enemies thought. Listen. Where his enemies thought to make a show of him. To expose him to public scorn and contempt. And to triumph over Jesus. 
But His cross, oh glory, but His cross became the triumphant chariot. Did you hear that? The cross became the triumphant chariot in which He triumphed over the powers of hell when He had conquered them by it and said it is finished and the temple veil was rent in twain. He made a show of the devil openly. He triumphed over the devil. That which God prophesied in the Garden of Eden had taken place on the cross of Calvary. When Jesus stomped the head of the enemy with His finished work on the cross, He triumphed over principalities and powers and rulers of this world, rulers of darkness of this world. He triumphed over them. When? Where? How? Did He do it in hell? We've covered that subject before. There was no struggle in hell that took place. We've got songs out there where people say, oh, the demons of hell was, had Jesus down for the count. And Carmen had this big video made where Jesus and the devil was in a boxing ring and the devil had Jesus down and it was going to be one, two, and all that. That's... The victory was won on the cross. Not in a three-day struggle for power in hell. When He said it was finished, He meant what He said and He said what He meant. Amen? It is finished. This is what I came to do. This I finished it. The enemy has been defeated. He made a show of them openly. He triumphed over them. I don't know how much plainer it can get than that. Mark that in your Bible. He triumphed over them. Listen to me. He triumphed over blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. See, the law was a stumbling block for man. Amen? It had to make do till Jesus came, but it was a stumbling block. You know why? Because Brother Sleeves couldn't keep it. But Billy couldn't keep it. So Jesus had to fulfill it. <laughs> Amen. It was a stumbling block to you. So He removed it. He, he, he completed it. The fact that you had to complete it no longer exists because He completed it. And when you put your trust in Him, He imputes that righteousness to you. And He nailed this stuff to His cross. He spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly. Triumphing over them in it. I don't know how much plainer it gets than that. If you can't understand that, I don't know how to help you. His cross, His victory there, His finished work there. Not that piece of wood, but His work that He came to do. When He stood before Pilate, He said, For this cause came I into the world. This is why I came. Jesus didn't come to make you rich. Jesus didn't come to make you a superstar. Jesus came to give you eternal life, to take away the sin of the world, to be the sacrifice for mankind, to defeat principalities, and powers and the rulers of darkness to, so that you can have victory today. And when we put our trust in that and our faith in that, Brother Billy, will I still struggle? Sure you will. We'll all still face trials. We'll all still face a battle. But like I told you before, there's a big difference in going through a battle not knowing whether you're going to win or whether it's going to kill you and going through a battle knowing that victory has already been proclaimed. That victory has already been won. That the victory belongs to you because you've been washed in His blood and you're trusting in His finished work on the cross. And that is God's prescribed order of victory. Always has been, always will be. The, the, the lambs in the Old Testament, the altars they built, the blood that was shed, all pointed to one cataclysmic event in the history of mankind. And that was when He hung between heaven and earth and He proclaimed His work was done and the temple veil was rent in twain from top to bottom and now man can go boldly into the throne room of God by way of the blood of Calvary and the finished work of the cross. Mm -hmm. Victory is yours today. The victory is yours. God has given you that. He speaks to you these words. Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, this enemy that you face. For the battle is not yours, Brother Rodney, but God's. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourself. Stand still. See the salvation. See the victory. See the triumph of the Lord today. Put your faith in God's prescribed order of victory. Because I know you've tried the fasting and it didn't work. 
Not that fasting is not a good thing. Fasting is a good thing, but fasting will not get you victory over sin. Victory over sin was won at the cross only through the blood of Jesus. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. There is no power within you other than Jesus Christ that can do it. The good news today is that if you have Jesus in you, the Bible says greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Why? Because He has triumphed over principalities and over the powers of darkness in His cross and His finished work. That victory belongs to you today. Just as He spoke to Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into your hands. He speaks that to you today. Fear them not, for I have delivered the enemy into your hand today. All of those that died in the wilderness died there because they could not put their faith and their trust in the promise that God had made. You see, the victory was already won for them. All they had to do was put their faith in it, march across Jordan, and take the land. Because it had already been promised to them. But they, they, they see something inside of man. We want to do it ourselves. We want to be justified by works. We want to do things that makes us holier. Holiness only comes through the blood of Jesus. Justification only comes through the blood of Jesus. Victory only comes through the blood of Jesus. And when we realize today that our enemy is already defeated, then we won't spend so much time sitting around thinking, oh, He's going to kill me. It's over. He's going to keep me from making it. No, if you don't make it, you'll keep yourself from making it. Because Jesus has already given us the victory. That's God's prescribed order of victory today. Faith in the cross and His finished work. Because He's already defeated your enemy. Someone else this morning have something before we go. I went a little longer than I intended to. I hope someone got something out of that.